Hello, welcome to Jurassic Park 3 Minute. We'll be discussing the second Jurassic Park sequel one minute at a time. I'm Brad. I'm Dave. And today we're back to discuss Minute 70 of Jurassic Park 3. Before we get to that, briefly over, not over at Jurassicpedia.com because I didn't, uh, couldn't find the listing there. Um, I had to check Wikipedia for uh, the fish species we're about to see in this minute. It's interesting, I, I could only find Benitos, whereas uh, Grant says Benitas. I thought that's what they were. Because whenever I typed Benitas, it kept on autocorrecting to Benitos. Oh, that's which weird. Is, yeah, which all the descriptions say they're a silver fish, so I'm guessing it's the Atlantic Benito, uh, which um, is pretty much a, a bait fish that apparently we can't, you can't really eat. I see a lot of uh, Google autocorrects saying, why can't I eat it, or, or can it be eaten, or how do you cook it properly, so... It does sort of bring up uh, how Grant knows the uh, fish species. We'll discuss a little bit more about that later on in the mm-hmm. in the episode. But uh, it's sort of on the wrong side. It's an Atlantic fish and not a Pacific fish. So why it's at sauna, I'm not going to speculate that InGen's breeding marine creatures as well, <laughs> especially ones you can't eat. But yeah, I just thought it'd be interesting to have a look at the uh, what Grant and what Eric are seeing, avoid, avoiding predators under the water. Because I believe that we actually came up that it's it was the striped bonito. Mhm. That's what we said, right? The striped or the silver? Well, it's described as being silver-coloured fish, so that that's in the the script in the novel. Because the striped bonito is the one is the species that's uh, native to the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Well, that. And I think that's why we went with the striped. I mean, they're both kind of silvery, but the striped the Stripanita has a kind of striped pattern along the silver back. Mm. Yeah, well, we can get when we get to the the moment in the minute as well. We don't, we just get that sort of flash of silver through the water. We do. Look back, going back to VH day, VHS days. Often it was actually the spinosaurus swimming under the boat. So before... I did too. I, you know, going frame by frame, it was the first time I realized that we could actually see the bonitas in the water. I. I never even noticed it until yeah. going until the frame by frame. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's all right. You can uh, head over to Jurassic Dashpedia and check out some of the artic- other articles, and not this one. <laughs> or check out uh, the Wikipedia for <laughs> Benitas. <laughs> no, we definitely got this one. Um, it's the it's under Benito. Uh, okay. B O N I T O. Yep. And I don't know why it didn't come up in the search, but it's we do have a description of it. Um, got the description the growth habitat even its habitat on isla sorna okay i'll um i'm gonna add i'll add that link to the uh to the run sheet so uh everyone can check it out when they're listening to the episode cool nothing to worry about sir it's gonna be a walk in the park all right uh david ready to get into minute 70 sure as when in minute 69 of jurassic park 3 paul was telling grant that he had maybe enough juice one more call on the satellite phone and not to call the U.S. Embassy. They wouldn't do a damn thing. Up the front of the boat, Eric had spotted something in the water, and yelled out, Hey guys, come here, look at this. As we open on minute 70, everyone goes to the front of the boat, where Eric's crouched down. As we pull back on the river, the rain's falling in drenching sheets. We can see a school of striped bonitos swimming under the water's surface. Eric says something must have spooked him. Grant doesn't reply. He just tells Mr. Kirby to get the engines running. At the 21 second mark, as Paul gets to the back of the boat, he tells Eric to open the throttle, and goes to work immediately on the left engine, putting his belt around the top of the pulley, and trying to pull start it. Grant dials the satellite phone, and puts it to his ear, and we can hear the phone ringing. At the 28 second mark, we cut to a suburban household. Charlie's eating breakfast, and the phone starts to ring. He gets down and walks over to it, and picks it up, and says hello? At the 39 second mark, Grant realises it's not Ellie, but Charlie. His tone changes, and he tries to convince the boy to take the phone to Mummy. Take the phone to Mummy now. At the 50 second mark, Charlie says OK, and runs off the phone in hand. Meanwhile, we cut back to the rear of the boat, as Paul's still trying to get the engine running, but without much success. And as the minute ends, Grant's still trying to get a response from Charlie, as we pull back to the front of the boat and see the fin of the Spinosaur emerge from the water. As we continue from minute 69, Eric and Grant are at the front of the boat, and uh, we pull back to a view of the river and the river surface, and we get that CG 
uh, school of fish swimming that we were discussing back earlier. And it's sort of assumed here they're avoiding a predator um, because we cut back to Eric and Grant and they're both soaking wet and Grant says Benita's where I'd, I'd always thought he'd said beneath us. Well, he does have that New Zealander accent that kind of turns the O's into E's. Yeah, and we're going to have that same problem in a couple of minutes' time too when he's talking to Ellie, but uh, seeing the script now and seeing the uh, original novel, knowing that um, it's actually Benito's or Benita's as the fish species, I wonder if it's sort of a, if it's a very early callback to the original script where he was going to be Robin Crusoe on the island and mm. he sort of knew knew the fish species and that locally so he could eat, essentially. I don't know how he'd know what this fish species is. It is kind of intriguing, unless because I mean, in the in the first novel, he does have that um, hunter, hunter, fisher, outdoorsman kind of thing going on. Yeah, so correct. it's possible yeah. that they're bringing some of that over into the uh, into the movie, this movie, and he identifies them as a bait fish. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I suppose, and maybe maybe he read a um, some sort of tourist brochure or something on the plane on the way down, or. At an airport somewhere. True. Because it hasn't, hasn't been the first time he's been to Costa Rica, but oh yeah, I just I just thought it was interesting <laughs> that uh, he, this paleontologist knows some uh, Pacific fish mm-hmm. species. Um, but uh, Eric says something must have spooked him, and we sort of wonder why or what would have spooked him. Of course, we soon we'll see in a minute that uh, it's a spinosaur underwater. But I don't know. I don't know if the fish would be spooked by the spinosaur. I'd, I'd, I'd assume that this was sort of fresh water at this part of the river too, but it must be salt water if they're this far inland, um, which means we must be getting pretty close to the coast. The map, our, um, distri- our habitation map uh, for the species on Pedia does have it closer to the coast, yeah. yeah. But I think it's also following the um, fan map that we all pitched and put together for the for Isla Sorna where we place the Spinosaurus in this attack closer to the coast than and than it used to be. Yeah. yeah. Plus, if this is the uh, the Indian Marino Harbour and supplies are coming in from ship, then it's probably going to be mm-hmm. fairly close to the uh, to the ocean and not too far inland. Yeah. I'd imagine the water would be a bit more brackish over here than anything, you know? Mm. Which could explain the crane being submerged. Maybe this is high tide. And Could be. It'd have to be tidal too. Mhm. I never thought about that, but that's a good that's a good explanation. Yeah, but Alan doesn't reply. He just yells back to Paul, "Get the engine running, Mister Kirby." <laughs> and by this time, Paul's come over and stand, stood behind Eric. But uh, this will sort of pull back alongside the boat as uh, it continues to drift downstream, and uh, we get that small crane submerged in the river, coming into view in front of him. It's sort of it's a shame here because. The boat's obviously not moving. The way the camera is sort of coming back and swinging around the boat makes it look like the boat's moving forward because it looks like they're going to go straight into that crane <laughs> and not avoid it at all. And it's not really a concern that they're having. But so you pointed out something interesting to me before we started recording about the set the, that they're actually on right now. <laughs> yeah. We'd, we'd speculated that this was the uh, the Aviary Canyon set. Um, I'd, I'd done a little bit of a looking re, redo through some behind the scenes videos on youtube before this record and found some uh, interesting stuff um particularly at this minute the orientation of the crane is sort of along the riverbank so for them to be pointing directly into it now they're coming out from the canyon so they're heading across river not down <laughs> which is one little interesting thing but also uh in one of those photos and i'll, I'll or screen caps and i'll post them up you can clearly see the uh the base of the aviary in the background, which looks like it may have been redressed. You can clearly see the big concrete uh, pylons or footings where the aviary was and the uh, the gate they swam under um, has been repainted with the yellow and uh, the white and black construction sort of stripes on them and there's clearly floodlights and hand railings on top. And if you look over in the far corner, you can see that, that gate that the uh, pteranodons would have escaped out of. But, mm-hmm. yeah. I was thinking possibly maybe they deconstructed it just in general because i mean they're gonna they're gonna take the set down anyway when they're done filming so i was thinking maybe they just started kind of taking it apart and repurposed it in a way you know yeah but i think the um 
the behind the scenes we seen for that aviary gate and that there was nothing above that concrete those concrete pylons everything above that was cg there was just yeah. the beam the beam across so there was nothing really there to deconstruct now obviously looking behind the scenes stuff the uh the scaffold that monstrous scaffold cage has been removed and half the cliff face with it um mm -hmm. the, the cliffs here are only 10 15 meters tall with that where before they'll 50 feet tall <laughs> yeah but it's sort of one of, like even last couple of minutes we've, we're saying that in the background you can sort of slightly see these little objects in the background that might have been a completed set and they just didn't show it because of the way they had to film the animatronic in the river and everything else but now it sort of looks like well yes it is an older set it may have been redressed a little bit but they didn't really uh didn't really show a lot of it so i'll post those photos up anyway so everyone can see it's mm -hmm. it does suggest that there's a larger <laughs> larger site there whether it's supposed to be or not and this crane is definitely part of it and as we said before there could be a title issue here where it wasn't a platform to put piles in for a dock or something and that platform sunk to the bottom we do get some issues across these few minutes of uh river heights or river depths <laughs> especially when they go between that set and the uh the indoor water tank we uh we get some different water heights but we can get to them in a little bit later as everyone rushes to the different spots on the boat, we cut to uh, the rear of the barge as Amanda goes into the wheelhouse and Eric's beside her and Paul runs past and making a beeline for the engines and tells Eric to open the throttle. And he's, he goes back to that left-hand engine again, which makes me think he, he definitely couldn't get the right-hand engine going and that's why he's not even worrying about it now. That left-hand engine's the one they had running before and he, he sort of goes mm -hmm. straight to that to, uh, to try and get it working. But um, as everyone goes to work, you can clearly see the crane again in front of the boat and... Uh, you can definitely see that the boat's not moving at all. <laughs> all these scenes we're going to get coming up, the the boat must be anchored because it's it's not moving, it's not drifting, it's just sitting there. But um, we cut to uh, Alan standing on the standing in the rain, holding the satellite phone, and he uh, turns it on and starts to dial. And uh, that's when we cut back to Paul briefly as uh, he gets his belt again and uh, tries to start the motor, but it doesn't fire. So again, that that belt's coming into use there to try and get this motor going. Mm -hmm. And then we cut back to Grant as he finishes dial and puts the phone to his ear. Again, behind him, you can see the Rocky Canyon walls of the aviary set, and they're not moving. <laughs> Which uh, <laughs> another little, another little identifier there that the boat's sort of anchored. But we hear the the phone start to dial, and Grant here does the old pick up, pick up, pick up, <laughs> trying to the force the person the other end on the other end of the uh, line to answer. And that's when we cut to daytime in a nice looking kitchen dining area in a house mm -hmm. and uh, we got Charlie sitting on the chair I couldn't see if he was eating there or doing doing painting or drawing or something it looks like he's uh, got a bowl of cereal or something yeah. he's, he's in his pajamas I assume it's morning but that time frame makes like no sense unless they're like at like break of dawn at this part and they just can't really see it because it's pouring out and Charlie's up at like 7am you know well, we do get, I think it's next minute, where she's outside saying goodbye to Mark. So maybe he's on his way to work and it is that earlier morning. Yeah, it could be. I, I mean, that's the only way I can imagine it makes sense is that it's like 5 a.m. Oh, and oh it, that early. And, uh, Costa Rican time and probably like 7 or 8 a.m. Washington, D.C. time. Both the script and the novel say it's night time, so... I don't, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know why they went for this in the film instead. Well, I mean, night is technically more of a sense of sun positioning than time, mm. you know? I mean, 1 a.m. is still technically the morning, but it's night, you know? Yeah. And it makes sense, too, if Barney playing on the TV would be a morning, morning cartoon for the kids, because they're always mm -hmm. up early. <laughs> but uh, Alan hears the, uh, the phone pick up and immediately yells Ellie and... We get Charlie say hello, <laughs> and uh, Grant realizes who he's talking to, and you just see the sort of the smile and then the look of frustration on his face as he um, as he realizes he's going to have to try and convince <laughs> or get Charlie to get Ellie for him, knowing how mm -hmm. flat that phone battery is and the, uh, the uphill battle he's about to have. But mm -hmm. I do like here too, while he's on the phone talking, you can hear Paul in the background, and I'm sure it's just a audio effect that they've reused and they haven't actually got William H. Macy sitting there trying to pull the engine over and over and over again while the, uh, the camera's not on him, but you can hear him try and start the engines and uh, clearly they're not wanting to go. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, yeah, I just looked. I just looked it up. And apparently, Costa Rica is two hours um, behind Washington D.C., which I believe is where Ellie is supposed to be living. Mm. And so, if it's like say seven a.m. or seven, even seven thirty in the uh, at night, and I mean in the morning, it, at Ellie's place, it could very, very easily be five a five a.m. And the sun has is just about to rise at uh, on Isla Sorna, and the we do see after this Spinosaurus attack break of dawn for them. So it, it, the time frame can make sense. Yeah, it's got to be close to that because even even Costa Rica being closer to the equator than Washington, surely the morning would have to get sunlight earlier. I suppose depend on what time of year it was, but. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that that sort of five-ish to seven-ish gap seems to like make the most sense. Mm-hmm. Which sort of makes you wonder that them poor people have been drifting in that boat all night, <laughs> early early morning to uh, go for a dive in spinosaur poop, <laughs> and now <laughs> and now be in the river, the coldest part of night, and they're going to be swimming in the river. Mm-hmm. But Alan pleads with Charlie, take the phone to mummy, take the phone to mummy now. It's the dinosaur man, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> You can, like, really, really hear the New Zealander accent breaking yeah. through here, especially <laughs> yeah. when he's saying the word ma- mom instead of mom, you know, with yeah, the well, U. Yeah, that, that's it. Like, you were American saying mom in that sounds so much more natural than me trying to say it, where I, was, I can say mom and it sounds more natural for me. But, yeah, you can definitely, definitely hear it coming out there. But mm-hmm. Charlie says okay and starts to walk down the hallway. And uh, we can hear the tiny voice of Grant for speaker asking Charlie to listen to him. And um, that's when we cut back to Paul. Again, having a hard time with the engines, we get to see him try and pull start one more time. And as the uh, minute ends, we get a shot from downstream as uh, the fin of the Spinosaur emerges from the water and it's heading directly towards the boat. And Yeah, exactly. Definitely enjoys And I do love here too how you can see the sort of fin contortion and move backwards and forwards to, to show mm. that it looks like it's on the back of the animal as the animal's swimming much mm-hmm. like a crocodile would which we can we can ask now do you reckon it's swimming here or is it walking on the riverbed depends on how deep the river is i think it's probably swimming more crocodile like um imagine say the t-rex in the novel where even if she could theoretically touch the bottom she's more likely to just kick her legs back and start swimming yeah, yeah. Like the the classic example of that on screen would be the ninety seven Godzilla where it sort of same thing just lets its arm and legs trail behind as it uses its tail to swing back and forth and mm-hmm. propel itself forward. Um, again much like a crocodile. Mm-hmm. And even that concept art for what was it, I think was it um the PS one game where we got the concept oh, art yeah. of the T Rex yep. attacking the raft? I love that early stuff. <laughs> I know, that is so great. Because it's sort of interesting too, as as we see the fin approach a boat, you can clearly see the crane now behind the boat. So they've got past it somehow, and <laughs> stopped on the other side of it. So it makes sense later on when Paul sort of jumps off and swims swims to the crane, and everyone else is downstream of it. But and maybe if that crane is on something at the edge of the riverbank, when the uh, water's down, then it's a lot deeper here. But yeah, we have the same issue next minute. So <laughs> we can discuss it more then. Also, uh, in the background, as the fin's approaching, you can hear Alan calling to Charlie again and asking if he's taken the phone to mom. Um, 